So after getting numerous emails about this over the last couple of years from listeners, I'm finally making the move to Patreon. Many of you have requested a way to donate directly to me, and Patreon is a great way to do it. The place to go is patreon.com slash most notorious. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash most notorious. And you'll be able to both contribute to the show and receive some cool perks as well. One of those perks, I've been going through all of my old podcast episodes recently, scrubbing them clean of all advertisements and uploading them one by one. And there are 90 plus total episodes. So a bunch of them are already there and I'll keep adding to them over the next week or two until the entire catalog will be available ad free and all new episodes, of course, as well. And this won't be just for my regular Most Notorious podcast. My new one, tentatively titled Minnesota's Most Notorious, Where Blood Runs Cold, will run ad-free there too. Plus, I'll be adding a bunch of bonus material, extra bits of interviews, secret bonus episodes, videos of me visiting the actual crime sites from my new podcast, monthly chats, discussions, and more. So again, go to patreon.com slash most notorious, check it out, donate if you feel moved to, and keep this all going. I'll see you there. Now, on to the episode. Welcome to the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. I've done a few episodes in the past on the Mafia. They're consistently some of the highest listened to episodes. But because we focus on older history here, I tend to shy away from it. Plus, there are other podcasts that concentrate almost exclusively on the subject and are able to paint a broad history of the mob from its origins all the way to its current incarnations better than I'm able to do in this format. But there is something about the Black Hand, that mysterious affiliation of Sicilian gangsters in America, especially at the turn of the century, just fascinates me to no end. And its structure and methods have always been of great interest to me. We touched on it in our Axeman of New Orleans episode, but when I came across the book that eventually became the subject of today's episode... I couldn't resist, and the fact that it comes with a real-life early Elliot Ness-style hero made it irresistible to me as a topic. I'm so happy to have as my guests today William Oldfield and Victoria Bruce, authors of the brand new book called Inspector Oldfield and the Black Hand Society. It officially became available on August 21st. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. So I've never interviewed two authors at once. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll just ask questions as I usually do, and either of you can answer them, and then you can both add whatever you'd, you'd like, if that makes sense. So so how did you come to collaborate on this book together? Well, uh, this is Victoria, and um, it's one of those stories of just a chance meeting in a coffee shop, I think, where a lot of deals are done these days. And, um, you know, in walks this guy, and I'm in the middle of something, and he's bothering me, and he says, you know, I have this great story, you know, you look like a writer, and maybe you'd be interested in him. You know, I'm rolling my eyes, and all of a sudden, William starts to talk about his great-grandfather, how he busted the first organized crime ring in America, and uh by the way, all of the evidence from the trial is back at my apartment down the street. (laughs) So I'm, of course, like instantly dying and wanting to work on this book. And that was like four or five years ago. This is William. Um, I had started a small company about, oh, I don't know, three or four years ahead, you know, before that. 
And so the coffee shops became where you network and you ask, you know, you occasionally meet people that are also entrepreneurs. It's sort of a field for entrepreneurs, you know. And so I try to engage people, you know, in coffee shops just to see what they're up to and you never know, you know. And I've been doing research for, oh my gosh, uh, since 2004. And I talked to so many agents and, and, uh, and other writers and other people. And you know, you, one gets to a point where they, there's so much evidence and so much information piled up that you think, I need to collaborate on this. You know, I need, it needs to be a team effort, not just a single person. And that's how it started. And I just said, you know what, I'm going to start looking. And uh, the worst thing that can happen is somebody can say no. You know, <laughs> well, Vicky, Vicky Victoria said yes. Well, congratulations on that. Book writing has always been such a solitary occupation, traditionally. I'm always fascinated by, by people who write books together. Who, who did what? And, and did you get along well through the process? Go ahead, Vicki. You want to go with that? Okay. <laughs> so, we, uh, I'll take this question. We sort of talked about, um, well, we talked a lot. So the beginning was, you know, basically William dumping boxes and boxes of, of research at my house um, that he'd done over 13 years. And he's like an incredible researcher. So it was a very comprehensive study, a very comprehensive amount of material, including like real trial evidence like death threat letters from the Sicilian Mafia at the time, his great grandfather's case notes. You know, he was a post office inspector. And so, you know, we show in the book like this amazing amount of real life data and things that were used in the trial at the time. And so that's what I first started to look at. And at the same time, I would interview um, William. And, and I mean, he can tell you about that process. I was probably just hounding him constantly for <laughs> for more. Well, it, it uh, like she said, like Vicky said, um, the the family story, you know, intrigued me as a child. And of course, you know, how, how could it not? And when my mother passed away, she basically let me finally get that before she passed away, get that final look, you know, at, at all the information. And uh, my great grandfather and his wife uh, basically took everything home after the trial instead of leaving it, you know, in Washington at the, uh, in the archives or at the, at the, uh, at the headquarters of the, of the department of the post office at the time, as it was called and took it all home. And it was sort of unprecedented. It wasn't really common to do that. So I was stuck with actual stamps that says, you know, uh, would say evidence, you know, item number one, whatever. And just, it just stacked up and just huge piles of it. And, at the, and huge amounts of newspaper articles that were sent by other inspectors from around the country uh, to John Frank and his wife uh, from other papers, uh, even papers in Italy, actually, and in England, and put them in this big scrapbook as well. So we not only had the, all the letters and, and those things, but we also had, and the evidence, but we also had a mass amount of media of the time. Uh, and of course, back then everything was newspaper so it was heavily sensationalized and so when I did the research I had to try to confirm are these things did they really happen the reporters got the names wrong or they or they embellished or that sort of thing and so Vicky would interview me for, of, of all these details and then she had to dive in and confirm because uh, uh, there were even names that were incorrect uh, as I said before and we had to find out who was who and, and who did what. Uh, and it was just an amazing collaboration. Uh, Vicki, what about your, uh, your Rugs Gallery, you know, <laughs> to, get, to get familiar, you know? Yeah, for about four months, you know, my whole family had to live with um, basically a Rugs Gallery. It was like a lineup. I would make a full-size, you know, portrait of these guys' mug shots and put them in the living room put their names on them, put where they were from, and tried to organize in a way because there was so much, there were so many mafiosos, there were so many lawmen that it was just so confusing for me at first. And I couldn't, I had to put names to faces to locations 
So that was actually really fun. I liked it. I would have left it up, but my husband wouldn't let me. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't wait to talk about that in a little bit. A, a rogues gallery is an absolutely perfect description of, of this collection of characters in the Society of the Banana, which we'll, again, we'll talk about shortly. But before we get there, I'd like to ask you about this. Um, I'm guessing most people don't associate the U.S. Post Office with crime fighting and law enforcement, but there was and is a law enforcement hand to the organization. And it really becomes a heroic organization in your story. So set this up for us, if you could, what was the, the role of post office inspector, especially at the, the beginning of, of American history? And if you could, tell us what made that position special w- within the, the realm of law enforcement. Well, I can take the, that initially. Um, when I first talked to Vicki, uh, she had that same question. Who are these guys? What do they do? Where did they come from? And why were they able to do what they were able to do, and even today what they do? Well, uh, Vicky can go into the, the, some of the details as well, but at the very beginning of the post office uh, uh, with William Goddard and, and Benjamin Franklin, William Goddard didn't get the job he thought he was going to get, which was to be the, the first postmaster. Uh, ben Franklin was given that role. William Goddard was given the job as what they called surveyor back then. So he, he was the first post office inspector, if you want to call it that. And number one, badge number one. And his job was to create the routes, identify uh, dangerous areas, identify uh, uh, distances, and and all these details, audit the the individual post office's finances as they were built. In addition to that role, since it it became a cabinet-level agency or department uh, in the U.S. government at one point, where the postmaster actually sat on the cabinet of the president because it was so important. And uh, treaties were made also overseas as the United States grew, and the post office had to have secure ways to to send uh, mail and money and other things around the world as as well as across the United States. So as that occurred, the post office inspector, the role, became more and more important and because of these treaties, and it was going across the new state lines across the country, it became the most powerful uh, law enforcement position of, of any uh, type in the, in the country. And at the time when Oldfield, when Frank Oldfield became post office inspector number 156 since William Goddard, so it shows you there really aren't that many of them. At that point, you had the Secret Service, the U.S. Marshals, and a budding, just beginning research organization, investigative organization called the FBI, which really had no other authority except to do uh, support uh, for the other law enforcement agencies. And so the post office inspector was able to use any form of transportation, could uh, take another person's vehicle or commercial vehicle and give a chit or a promise, basically a signed promise that he would return it, to do whatever was necessary to capture a criminal. And since everything was done through the post office, including moving the, the federal, uh, eventually the Federal Reserve's money, uh, all gold, everything, any currency, everything was transported by the post office, the inspector basically had carte blanche across all forms of uh, crime because everything used the post, and anything used the post was under their jurisdiction. And that's how it, it grew to that kind of power uh, and ability to then... Uh, secondly, go to any local law enforcement and to recruit them under federal authority to be part of the investigation. If you want to build a posse, I guess it would be a great way to explain it. Fascinating. So I'd like to ask you more about Frank Oldfield. Tell us about his life and the events that eventually led him to the Postal Service. I, I think as, as his great grandson, uh, William, you should take that one because the, the stories that, that he told about that were just so enthralling to me and, and, um, that really in the book, you just, you kind of fall in love with this character, you know, and he's just such a dynamic guy that, um, I'll let William sort of talk about his background. And I want to add real quick here. One, one of the great things about your, your book, a, a lot of true crime nonfiction focuses on a notorious 
murder or a murderer. But yours really centers around Frank Oldfield, this, this crime-fighting hero. I think that's wonderful to, to see it that way. We saw it that way as well. Um, there were so many uh, interesting characters on the the pro and the negative, you know, the positive and the negative side of this of this investigation. And uh, in a, in a sense, there were almost rogues on both sides. Uh, now, Frank, uh, as a, as a young man, uh, his father, my great great grandfather, Hamilton, where I got my nickname Hammy, had been in the Civil War. Uh, as more of a uh, desk jockey. And because of that, uh, early Republican Party, and at the time, Republican politics uh, out in Maryland, uh, and also Democrat politics was uh, a lot of, you know, you've got your, your appointments, you know, so if you were a friend. So uh, let's just cut to the chase. And Frank started out uh, working for his father uh, in, in, in some of the mills that he had. And was always a very dapper guy, so that wasn't sort of his blue collar thing. wasn't really, you know, wasn't his style. So he was always looking for an opportunity to get involved in uh, other things like politics or, you know, some other profession. Well, his father was granted a post office franchise through his relationship in the Republican Party uh, in Maryland, and immediately Frank was given a job as a clerk there. And a post office clerk back in the day was, was actually a pretty prestigious and well-paying job, responsible for money and, and fiduciary responsibilities, that sort of thing. So you were kind of important. And any relationship with the federal government went through the post office. If you needed something, you know, something from Washington or whatever, it always came through that, that local office. So you were sort of the, uh, the intermediary, the middleman between the federal government and the people in any community. So Frank seemed to love that. And, uh, uh, enjoyed, I think, some of that responsibility, uh, made him a little bit larger than life, I think. You know, it, it builds up your, your internal, uh, your ego a bit. Well, what happened was is that he had also, you know, run for other offices, that sort of thing. I won't get into all the details because we'll give up, we'll reveal everything in the book. But he tried other forms of politics, got, got himself in trouble, got himself a, a big name and then a, a nefarious name. And uh, so he, he had sort of a colored, interesting past. Once he became a post office clerk, though, everything sort of stabilized. And then the opportunity came to him to become, you know, become appointed a post office inspector. And that, I think, was the best thing that ever happened to him because you're very autonomous as an inspector and no one's telling you what to do and you can be your own boss. And I really think that that's uh, sort of in the, in the blood even today in our family. Uh, we all love to be entrepreneurs. And because of all his political wranglings, he and his brother and his father, uh, it looked to me like actually he was appointed uh, to kind of remove him or to get him out of the picture so other Republicans could take offices and power and whatnot. So they shipped him off to Chattanooga, you know, which from Ellicott City, Maryland, back in that day, was a, was a, was a haul. It was a long way. So it's sort of like putting him out in the, in the, the pasture. Well, he did a great job chasing bad guys down there and safe crackers and, and postal robbers and, and all sorts of train robbers and all sorts of other nefarious characters. But he still remained involved in Ellicott City and Howard County, Maryland politics, which was a no-no as an inspector. You were supposed to relinquish all those because it was considered unethical. Well, he got caught, and the post office inspection service, the chief inspector and the postmaster, had him removed. He's the only post office inspector ever to be uh, fired and removed. And in his original record, there's a giant handwritten letters removed at the top of his file. It's pretty funny. And then um, about a year later, uh, with a, quite a bit of wrangling by, I think, his father and, and other people, he was reinstated and uh, supposedly out of politics. And they were shipped off to some, uh, the Cincinnati domicile, southern Ohio. And where he actually uh, shined and really did a great job there was even asked by the service to uh, investigate as a uh, impartial inspector, investigate corruption in the New York City area uh, post office, uh, which turned into another rogue situation where he got in a fight with the uh, assistant district attorney who was actually uh, involved with one of his relatives in some of the corruption. And then uh, once he got shipped back to Ohio, he just went back to the normal routine of, of auditing post offices like Ben Goddard did, uh, looking at routes, 
making sure finances were correct, occasionally getting a great opportunity to uh, chase a bad guy. But normally it's pretty boring until 1908. And if Vicky, if you want to hit from there, you've got to, you you really know about what happened in 1908. So. Uh, well, I think that was a good timer, and then you know the exciting part came in. But I'll let Eric ask us more questions about that. Okay. Yeah, you paint a great picture of him. He was a man of action, right? He wasn't someone who who liked to sit behind a desk and and push paper. Absolutely, uh, we sort of discovered that. We all talked about that in our family lore, you know, how exciting he was. But when we found out what a post office inspector's primary role was, we thought, how did he, could he handle that? Like I said, all the paperwork and the audits and the boring things like, like that, working with postmasters to make sure all the, the stamps were counted, that kind of thing. It's very boring, you know, that part of the work. And he was looking for excitement, like you said. And, you know, he, he absolutely lit up and, and, was dogged and uh, definitely an, an intrapreneur inside the, the post office because when he took over an investigation, he used the, the practices that they had available, which were highly complex at the time, uh, from handwriting analysis to even stakeouts to uh, a number of other identification techniques you know, uh, that they had that were ahead of their time around the world. But he also made his own rules. In other words, to make sure, it's almost like a uh, the concept of I'm going to be dogging and I'm going to get my man. I'm going to ca- I'm going to catch him regardless of what it takes. So this is such an interesting time period for organized crime. These are the very very early beginnings of the mafia, far far different than what we know it to be now. And it was very much a strange foreign entity. This, this influx of Sicilian criminals. And period law enforcement agencies really struggled with this. And and to make matters more difficult, there were really no Italian-American police officers or detectives to deal with this sharp rise in crime associated with these groups. One of the really interesting stories you tell, and forgive me if, if I mispronounce his name, involves Francis DeMeo, who eventually joins the Pinkertons and has his own compelling arc as well and even joins forces with Frank Oldfield later on. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Um, DeMaio almost deserves his own book because he was so fabulous. So back in um, the around 1905, there was the, the LAPD was aware of what you just talked about. They, they needed Italian detectives to infiltrate the Italian crime that was going on in the city, Manhattan and Brooklyn, and they hired a guy named Joe Petrosino, who was um, actually on the NYPD, and he was known as be, to be a real tough guy. And the Pinkertons were national detective agency, but they were government contractors, so they would hire out to private um, industry and also government industry. And they also realized about the same time that, wow, we don't have anybody We've got, um, actually, they realized it earlier than the NYPD. They said, we, we need somebody who's Italian because a lot of these corporations were getting hit by um, mafia type um, extortions, their employees, kidnappings, and things like that. And um, so they, uh, the two brothers, the Pinkerton brothers who owned the company after their father passed away, they were friends with a New Orleans chief of police named Chief Hennessy who was murdered, and this is um, post-Civil War, so we're talking, you know, a decade before uh, the turn of the century, and uh, it turned out to be a crime, um, an Italian sort of mob crime that killed the police chief. The Pinkertons went out, and they said, we really need to find somebody of Italian descent who can solve this crime and infiltrate these gangs because, yeah, you're absolutely right. There were no Italian detectives um, on the police in New Orleans or, or really anywhere else around the country. So DeMaio, Francis DeMaio, goes down there, and he is this amazing undercover artist. And he studies a character who's a counterfeiter and gets himself imprisoned in the New Orleans Parish Prison, this filthy, dirty place. You know, here he was um, surrounded by all these m- mafiosos that were waiting for trial, and he was terribly ill. He dropped 30 pounds. He had dysentery, and 
Um, but he, you know, and when the Secret Service were trying, you know, passing messages saying, do you want to get out? We need to save your life. He said, no way, I'm staying. And he knew it was really close to cracking the case. And he ends up really getting a guy to confess to that murder and one of the big crime families that was down in New Orleans. So the Sicilian Mafia actually really starts in New Orleans post-Civil War. And that's another thing that's fascinating that um, uh, we tell about in the book. Now, I did an episode a few months ago about the Axemen of New Orleans, and, and I'm sure you're familiar with that story. We did have a little bit of a discussion on the Black Hand in that episode, but I think a refresher here is important. Could you define the Black Hand? What was it exactly? Well, I can give it give a, a try at this one. The concept comes from all the way back to Sicily before Italy actually came together. So all the way back, you know, hundreds of years, actually. And the concept of the, of the, of the hand of death, the black hand, uh, was used to, um, to terrorize families, basically extort them for, for quite a while. And then, of course, let's move to people immigrating to the United States. You have a massive Italian immigration to the United States. And, of course, the Sicilian bad guys always follow, you know, you got to follow the money. So they continue the concept of that terror organization, uh, you know, putting terror into uh, uh, mainly Italian families and especially business owners. And, of course, they're paying what some people call, in, you know, the, the insurance today, you know, the insurance business, where you're basically protecting, the, you're protecting them against yourself. You know, you're, they're paying you to protect them, themselves against you. But... That's how it really starts, and they use the La Mano Nera, you know, they, and they use terrible drawings of knives and daggers and actually black hand graphics, you know, drawn on the, on the paper, either pin them to their doors with a dagger and then continue to harass, and eventually uh, the concept of, uh, of the, the hand of death, you know, or the black hand, usually creates a friend, which, and a friend is uh, the term used by the black hand of any business or a person who begins to pay. And they refer to them as a friend amongst one, the, amongst the, the gangsters themselves. Say, well, uh, so-and-so Di Camilli family is, or the Fasson family, they're now friends of ours. So friend Di Camilli is uh, working, you know, is, uh, is providing us uh, support. And what I meant by support, of course, was he's giving them money. And that's really where the Black Hand starts, but they really hadn't br- branched off into... Um, all the other areas of the modern mafia from prohibition on where they diversified. This was mainly just an insurance racket and terror to take control over territory and money. And if, if people did not comply, you, it was a very brutal follow through from stabbings, beheadings, bombings, quite a bit of uh, a very violent activity the, the, the longer they've been in the country, the more, the more violent they are. So let's get a little more specific now. Could you talk about the Society of the Banana and the Lima family? This was a a very real organization that operated under the umbrella of the Black Hand, right? Right. So the Lima, so Sam Lima is our notorious bad guy. Uh, He's the sort of self uh, appointed president of the Society of the Banana, and they call themselves the Society of the Banana because back you go, going all the way back to New Orleans, they were fruit dealers. So the Sicilians took over the fruit trade um, from South America, around the country, and really became, a lot of them became prosperous. So under the guise of being a fruit seller, Sam Lima and his father, Antoni, uh, Antonio Lima, his brother-in-law, Sebastian, also named Lima, gets confusing, they all have this little fruit store in Marion, Ohio, a tiny little town. And they go there because they have really, you know, the police there are not a threat to them at all. They become ingratiated in the community. They, you know, they're just, uh, they have lots of money in the bank, obviously. And, um, you know, everybody likes them in town. And what they do is they go to other cities around Columbus and they terrorize people, as William was saying. You know, they bomb uh, establishments, they kidnap, they, they maim, they murder. And, um, but, you know, Sam Lima on his own is a dad. He looks like the American dream. He's got a wife and kids and a storefront and sells bananas. 
So they're, you know, in, in sort of a comical way, they call themselves the Society of the Banana, this one group. Um, and also they, they sign their letters, the black hand, but internally they are the Society of the Banana, and that's how they address each other. And um, we're part of William's collection, and we have copies in the, in the book of these letters that say, you know, uh, be careful, don't send any banana bills, they're scheming. Uh, we need to steam the banana bills with all this coded language that has to do with fruit sellers. So, um, you know, with Sam Lima at the top, you had guys in all other, like Cincinnati and Columbus and Mer um, uh, Meadville, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And, you know, this is a far-reaching, you know, organized crime ring, and no police believed that that was true. They always thought that these were random murders, random kidnappings, and so on. And Sam Lima was kind of a struggling artist as well, wasn't he? <laughs> Can you describe some of these drawings he would he would scratch out on his letters? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a couple of them. You know, you'd see like a little cartoon coffin and a heart, like drawing the organ of a heart, not like a, you know, Valentine heart. And then with a dagger splashing through them, blood dripping off it. And, you know, sometimes there were, you know, there was red blood stains on the letters themselves. So he must have like pricked his finger to add a little drama and flair. So the society's primary means of making money, as you've already mentioned, shaking down families, small business owners, extorting money from them. When is Frank Oldfield turned on to all of this? How does he take this on as a case? And how does this develop into a crusade for him? Well, Vicky, take that one again, because it, uh, from what I referred before, uh, how boring it was for Frank and Alex and uh, how detailed it was for him. And then finally, in 1908, he gets a really, really fun opportunity. Um, the What happened, I think, you know, Frank was upset because, you know, like we talked about before, he had no, he had no way to infiltrate Italian crime. So the police knew it was happening. The post office detective knew. And, you know, this was a bothersome to him because there was almost nothing, he, no, you know, case that he took that he couldn't finish. And when a murder happened um, in, where was that in Ohio? Uh, oh, the, the Sierra murder, uh, Denison. Bella Fontaine. Oh, Bella Fontaine, Bella Fontaine, yeah. Yeah. And um, so this guy is murdered in his fruit store, and in his pockets are these death threat letters. So, you know, Frank, the because there are letters, the local police came, handed them over to Frank and said, okay, it's in your, you know, this is in your ballpark now because it's now a federal crime. And what are you going to do about it? Well, you know, Frank, pasty white, five foot four, 120 pounds soaking wet, you know, cannot, not speaking Italian, not a lick of it, you know, goes into these Italian communities and he tries to interview people. No one will talk to him, you know, so he's getting more and more aggravated. And that went on for a year and he had not, he hadn't had a single break in that case. So, the big case, now Sam Lima and all his cohorts are start going after people with, with a vengeance. And when Sam Lima took over the, the Society of the Banana, I mean, they were doing hun literally tens of thousands of dollars of extortion from numerous, numerous victims. Finally, they picked the wrong one, and that was this guy named John Amicon, who was an Italian fruit seller, a multimillionaire in Columbus. And he was not having it. And he got this letter, and he's like, there is no way, because I will not pay. They can kill me first. And while other uh, Italians were afraid to go to the police and afraid to say anything against the mafia, the black hand, he wasn't. And he ends up in Frank's office, you know, this big, portly guy, and he looks at his little, you know, scrawny, Caucasian detective, and he says, you know, I want to see Uncle Samma. And... You know, Uncle Sam referring to the government man, and he wanted help. And he said that he would testify, and that's how Frank was able to finally break into the case. So the Society of the Banana doesn't get wind of this right away, do they? That Amicon has gone to the authorities. And they're able to keep their investigation secret for a while. But Lima doesn't take it well when Amicon doesn't pay, right? And he continues to escalate his threats, even bombing his porch. Is that right? William, you want to take that one? Oh, oh yes, of course. I was Vicky was you're doing you were doing so well. <laughs> uh, 
Well, what it, it starts out, you've got Lena and a couple of his cohorts decide to come down to Marion, Ohio. They're not getting any response from Amicon. And so they go down there and they, they stand across the street from his very large uh, warehouse on Naughton Street, stand across from it with their arms folded, you know, looking, looking nefarious and uh, actually in, encounter John and his brother, Charlie. And uh, no fistfight or anything, but there's conversation, and it's a um, semi-polite conversation where you know your enemies, but there's other people walking by, and it's a, a great interchange between between them. Well, very soon afterwards, we start getting some problems. Marcino Saloon, which is basically where all the people that work at uh, Amicon's large fruit warehouse, distribution warehouse, it gets blown up, dynamited. You know, poor Marcino, probably, uh, it's difficult for us to find all the facts, but they used to hang out in the back of his saloon. Uh, so it looks like he at least tolerated them, but he must, uh, they must have used him to, uh, to threaten John because John was the big money person, John Amicon. And, uh, that didn't work. So then they go after, uh, John or Charlie's house and, uh, basically, uh, his wife finds a stick of dynamite inside of a newspaper. So that one doesn't go off. But there are subsequent threats uh, where they'll they'll come by the house at night. Now that John uh, and Charlie both have police protection now at their house, chasing off these guys at night on the other side of the gate or in the bushes or whatever. Eventually, uh, there is a there is a uh, the back porch is blown up on one of the houses, and it still doesn't work. You know, but it starts waking up, and there's a point where you really identify with with the with Lima, actually. And his other cohorts, they absolutely saw themselves as completely untouchable. They could, they called law enforcement buzzards. So you showed how they, you know, in their letters, it shows how they felt about them. And there's this this back and forth between Amicon and Lima, where these two, uh, Lima saw himself as just as big and just as powerful as Rockefeller and Carnegie and, and John Amicon, the American Dream. You know that he's he's going to be a powerful man just like they are. And Amicon was already there. He was already a powerful and successful man, you know, so there was a rivalry and I think a little chip on his shoulder as well on Lehman's side because he hadn't reached the, the level of success yet that Amicon had. And then when Oldfield is brought in, you know, he actually breaks every rule in the book and immediately does some investigating, but very soon after starts talking to the press and, and Vicky uh, really discovered what he did with the with the media, uh, if you want to explain that, and that's how they really interact with Amicon and Lima and Oldfield, it becomes this public battle. Uh, I think that is fun. That's a fun part of the story. You know, you watch Frank. Um, he's such a strategist, you know, and he knows how to work the the newspaper men, and, you know, they kind of want to stay on his good side so they can get the inside scoops, and at the same time, you know, he, he sort of plays the – the bad guys off one another, calling this guy the the head of the band. We're going to catch him because he's the one running everything when he knows that's not true. And so, you know, it's just a very, very fun story that, you know, you just can't believe that he was putting all these pieces together at once and making it work. One of the things you mentioned before was this cast of killers and oddballs that made up the Society of the Banana. And in your book, you describe them one by one. Were, were there any of these characters that, that stuck out to you most that were especially interesting to you? Well, I think for me, you know, Sam Lima is the one we know the most about because he was the godfather. And um, what's funny is we, it, you know, Frank has notes on him and, um, you know, there's there are newspaper articles about what he was, he said in court, you know, he's like publicly says how he's going to kill people, you know, in the middle of the courtroom. And, um, and what was, what's really cool is that, uh, you know, we sort of live with these guys for the, well, William has for 13 years, 14 years, and I have for the past four years. And um, at the end, you know, there's an epilogue, but we really, all of them stood out as really interesting characters. You know, you've got um, the one that I have a crush on is the guy who was uh, born on my birthday in, I don't know, 1880 or something like that, but Pepino Galbo, you know, he's so handsome. 
and he's got this arched eyebrow and a scar across his cheek and his diamond stick pin, you know, and he, um, you know, was just a well-loved person in the community. Um, everybody thought he had a legitimate business. So there, you know, each character has like this wonderful personality to us, even though they were murderers, you know, and you can't forgive that of what they did, but they all have, you know, very um, layered personalities. And in the end, you know, uh, we turned in the book, William and I, and we were like exhausted, you know, here it is. And our publisher came back and said, okay, but I want to know what happened to all of them. And honestly, <laughs> we were exhausted, but at the same time, it was something that I always wanted to do. But you can imagine, that's a whole nother month of research, you know, to find out what happened to them. And what happened to Sam Lima, I'm not even going to give it away because that was really cool to find out. But the readers will have to buy the book and read it for that. <laughs> uh, just just quickly, I wanted my favorite character growing up uh, as a child in our family lore and the first picture that was ever shown to me, uh, probably at oh, 10 or 12 years old, was Salvatore Rigo. And this guy was the old man. If you see all the Godfather movies, I mean, he's an old guy, and he's he's been in the business a long time, and he's just a colorful character. He looks the part. I mean, the photograph of him with a black shirt on, you know, it's just the best. Uh, and he's like 65 years old, you know. Uh, he's been a he's been convicted. He's been in jail multiple times. You know, he's seen it all, and I love that about his character. And they actually on March 9th, they all meet and they retire him. And they elect a new godfather. But it's the first time ever that any investigator ever was able to stake out a meeting of all the main captains and head of the mafia from all around the country. They get together and they retire good old Salvatore Rico and they pick somebody else to run the show. And, uh, you know, 50, 40 years before the, the famous Poconos meeting that we all hear about, you know. Yeah, I was just about to ask you about that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It was basically a who's who of early Sicilian gangsters. And as you mentioned, they elected someone to take over the society. I guess I have a two-part question. How did Oldfield learn about this meeting, number one? And then question number two. Once this meeting took place, Oldfield and, and company were able to discover a lot of new information about the organization. And this is probably my favorite part of the book. <laughs> They learned some of the laws and regulations of the Society of the Banana. <laughs> and I was hoping you might summarize this strange set of rules they followed. So the the meeting, we found through, you know, detail going through his case notes and his reports and everything that Frank uh, Oldfield actually had an informant on the inside. Um, and that was something we didn't know at first going in, like, how did he find out about this meeting? Because they were able to stake out a meeting when they had, you know, 14 mafiosos coming from all parts of, you know, the Midwest. And how did that happen? So later on, we find out that he had an informant, and we still don't know who that was. So at that point, you know, he was able to set up across the street. He was able to set up at the train station, and he had his fellow inspectors with him by this time. It's not just him. He's got a whole sort of army of, of lawmen from different agencies. And so that was really spectacular. Um, like William says, that's the first known mafia meeting that was ever witnessed by law enforcement. And it's 1909, so it's way earlier than anything we think of. And I'll, and I'll let um, William talk about the, the other part of your question. Uh, you have to repeat the other part for me again. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, oh. This, the laws and regulations of the society. Okay, that particular one. Okay, well, what happened was is what is, is Sam Sam uh, Sal, Salvatore Lima, who went by Sam, it was common to call him that. You know, in the, that day, he since he basically had uh, during the invitations to the meeting, uh, and the, what happened was is that the postal service quickly was able to use their clerks everybody else to track their letters and they were opening and they were able to uh, get some of the letters, the invitation letters uh, and take a peek at them uh, and then seal them back up and put them back out. And at the time you had to, you know, it was sort of a warrant related thing with the, you know, they had to do, but it gave them some ideas to Stan Lehman saying that, Hey, I'm now the controller, you know, I'm the boss now. And during the meeting that's confirmed. 
you know, when they all agree to that, he puts a letter out to everybody saying that we agreed to that, that I'm now sort of the, the controller. Uh, there's a figurehead godfather, but I'm sort of the guy that runs the business, you know, the COO, if you want to call it. And so what happened during the meeting is that it went on uh, through the night, you know, all the way into the next day. They had, they had to go out and get cops. And what they did is they sat down, they worked out how they're going to share money, that sort of thing, but they also worked out what are going to be the rules of how we run this national business? How's the money going to go back to Palermo, you know, to, to supply the, the bigger bosses there, that kind of thing. And so they started out with articles just like the U.S. Constitution, you know, and it actually Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, it's the best thing you've ever seen in your life. And it's very funny. Article 1 says, uh, basically, if you ever reveal that this gang exists or this organization exists, you know, you'll be killed. And then the second article <laughs> basically refers to another infraction, but the punishment is referred back to Article 1. So, you know, which is death. And it just goes on, what you know, article after article, each one of them having a punishment. One of those punishments, you will be uh, categorized as removed from the organization and categorized as a swindler. And the swindler, that must have been a horrible thing to be called back then, you know. That uh, the whole community will know that now that you're a swindler. And I thought, my gosh, that must be terrible to know that you're a swindler. <laughs> you know? But they're, they're, they're almost comical, each one of them, as they progress through the, you know, through the, uh, the articles. And at the time, if you look at it, the, before we had amendments, that sort of thing, there's almost the same exact number of articles in this Constitution as in the U.S. Constitution. So I'm wondering if Sam Lima really was following the American dream, looked at the U.S. Constitution. He probably read it, and, you know, to help back then, because they all did. They were all given it as part of their naturalization and that sort of thing. They said, I'm going to create my own. This is my own country, my own government. And it really is amazing how he took sort of that initiative. And, by the way, can you imagine the personal uh, ego you have to have, the strength? You have to see yourself as a president of a nation to have that kind of uh, confidence that you're going to write a constitution, you know. And they're very specific <laughs> about some of their punishments. <laughs> One of them is, is loss of membership accompanied by getting stabbed. <laughs> yes. Yes, he shall be stabbed. <laughs> and I another like one includes getting branded on the face. And then the last so that, one, I don't know if you remember, the last one is um, there will be some consideration taken to cases of inebriation or intoxication. <laughs> <laughs> so you're excused occasionally if you say something bad about the gang or talk about it in public if you're drunk. Okay. Right. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it really is comical. But uh, you see how also their, their level of education, you can also tell, is not very high. Uh, so they they have sort of a, a salt of the earth concept of 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 value of who adds value, you know, how someone's punished when they don't add value to the gang, you know, that sort of thing. Kind of almost a country rural, you know, sort of uh a vigilante style justice within their own organization. You know, very informal. Uh but it but it was codified. So we have to give them credit for that, you know, into the constitution. And again, I know we only have an hour together today, and, and we're running a little short on time right now, but Oldfield puts together this crack team, and it reminds me a little of the Untouchables. He handpicks a group, each with unique skills and contributions, and, and DeMeo, who you told us about a little earlier, joins them. He's extremely valuable, of course, because he speaks Italian, can blend in far better than the others. And you have a, a chapter called The Takedown, where these hoods are brought down one by one. There is a trial, and that's what I'd like to ask you about. What is the smoking gun evidence that prosecutors use to eventually prove their case? So, you know, from the beginning... Frank Oldfield's only sure thing as far as evidence was John Amicon's testimony, but then he also needed to show hard evidence. So he needed to show that there was, you know, a direct link from Sam Lima and an extortion letter that went to John Amicon. So through this very, very complicated scheme, um, they were able to follow a letter directly from Marion, Ohio, mailed by Sam Lima that ended up uh, going through a second person because uh, they would actually put it undercover 
uh, and in another letter, send it, and then that person would open it and resend it. So it never came from the original sender, and that went directly to to um, John Amicon, and they had marked the stamp, and that was one of the tools that they used were, were marking the stamp, so they followed it. And so that was the that was the piece of evidence that ended up convicting all of the uh, 11 that were convicted. Three were given new trial, but they were able to say, um, you know, this this happened, and then all the rest of them were that were convicted were convicted on conspiracy charges so they didn't have direct evidence so frank actually got really lucky that you know they had conspiracy charges which is what happens a lot of times it was mail fraud which you know sam lima gets the longest sentence of 16 years and then um the rest of them as well with lesser sentences what's pretty sad about the whole thing is this is a group of guys who committed extortion terror, assault, murder, and their sentences ultimately weren't very long, were they? No, and I think it's similar to tax evasion, you know, Al Capone, and, you know, because when you have local law enforcement or state law enforcement, it's much easier, more, you know, it's easier to corrupt those institutions if you have a lot of money, like these mobsters did. So, you know, they had to go after them with these federal crimes that really had very, very small sentences. And so 16 years was the longest. And, yeah, there were murders and kidnappings and all of that. But it was mail fraud, which is what took them down. So so the Black Hand, the Society of the Banana, what would their legacy ultimately be? I mean, is there a direct connection between their organization and, and later Italian gangsters in New York? Chicago, the rest of the country? Uh, yes, actually, uh, the Black Hand is the Mafia. They're basically one and the same. And uh, the Sicilian Mafia, that is, not the Napolitano, you know, from Naples or, or you know, other, other groups, but the Sicilian Mafia basically matures from the Black Hand concept of extortion. That's what some of these guys get out of prison, wherever they are in the country. There were a number of Black Hand uh, individual cases you know, local guys would get arrested in, say, Chicago or New York or whatever, and, and they weren't really in larger gangs. But uh, they they would – that went on until into the uh, – the prohibition started. The black hand – you still saw black hand arrests. And once some of these guys, because they couldn't really get them for the larger crimes, it was very rare they caught them, as Victoria said, but for murder or the larger, longer-term crimes. Once they got out of jail, they continued their, you know, their business. And as they became more sophisticated and media started calling them new names, they sort of took on the, you know, the colorful new names. Like I said, the syndicate, the mob, whatever. They, you know, they didn't, they didn't call themselves that. That was, that was the media sensationalizing it in the papers, you know, to sell papers, to create all those names. But what happened was, as you'll find out in our epilogue, uh, Sam Lima and many of these other people, as well as thousands of others around the country, continued, in, you know, to what you see as the mafia today. The black hand was the the foundation of the Sicilian mob that we, uh, you know, know and love in all of our movies and all of all of our TV shows. So you said Frank Oldfield was your great great grandfather. Great grandfather. Great grandfather. This was quite a, a feather in his cap for his career, right? What happened to him after this? Frank, it's a, the, the post office inspector was a, a political appointee. Frank rankled a, quite a few people because of his concept of getting things done, regardless of what it took to get it done. So he rankled a lot of traditionalists and career people within the Postal Service. So uh, in 1911, after his father died, uh, he resigned in November 1911. And from, from can you imagine what a great career uh, you know, for, for a pension and everything else, and took the, the entrepreneurial risk of, because of all his notoriety, and he got a lot of attention in the papers, uh, for a much higher private investigation role. And, he be- and, and what happened was is this case launched his career as a private investigator uh, to, the, to the, the rich and famous, from the Carnegies to the Rockefellers to the Boltons to, you know, uh, all the Great Lakes uh, big industrialists, the Strong family and the Reading, of the Ridge, Reading Railroad uh, in Pennsylvania. And it really allowed him to, to make a very, very good income compared to what he had made before. In fact, one customer in particular, this in the Strong family, uh, just the first year, 
was approximately five times what he made in a normal year. Just, just that one customer. So, you know, when he was with the postal inspection service. So that's what happened. And he basically continued all the way until his, his untimely early death in 1916. So that career was very short, but it was well traveled across the country. He took cases everywhere and, uh, really, and also brought his son, sometimes would bring his sons or a son with him to look like a father and son, you know, as a cover for a stake out, that kind of thing. Uh, quite, quite a colorful, uh, career after the inspection service. So the book dropped yesterday, August 21st. Where should we direct people who want to learn more about the story and your book? Yeah, um, I have a website, victoriabruce.com, that has links to buy the book um, at, you know, online booksellers. And it'll be wherever books are sold in your local bookstores, independent and chain Barnes and Noble type bookstores. And we are doing a lot of events. Uh, we'll be in, um, on the 24th, we will be in Washington, D.C. at Politics and Prose at 7 p.m. Uh, we will be in Annapolis, Maryland on the 25th. And if you go to my website, uh, victoriabruce.com, I have a calendar in it. Um, hopefully, we will be in a city near some of your listeners, and we would love to meet you and hear how you like the book. Perfect. And this was great that we were able to coordinate with, with all of our schedules. And there's a ton of information we weren't able to to cover in this conversation. So buy the book to get the entire story. Thanks again. Thank you, Eric. We really appreciate you doing this. Uh, Eric, thank you so much. Uh, this is wonderful. This we're, My entire family thanks you. Uh, we've been waiting 100 years to get this story out, and it's people like you that are letting us uh, tell this amazing tale. Again, I've been speaking to William Oldfield and Victoria Bruce, authors of Inspector Oldfield and the Black Hand Society. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.